Good evening, and welcome to Science and Food. I'm Amy Rowett, a professor in integrative biology and physiology here at UCLA, and founder of the Science and Food organization. So it's my pleasure to bring to you this evening food waste solutions informed by science and what you can do with your leftovers. This is the premier event in our fifth annual spring lecture series. As many of you know, this lecture series spawned from a course that I teach here each spring called Science and Food. The goal of my course is to teach students, who are mostly non-science students, how to be a scientist. So using food as a familiar medium, they make measurements, collect data, and generate evidence-based knowledge. So a shout out to many of the science and food students who are in the audience this evening, or they should be in the audience this evening. So before we get started, I wanted to, um, to uh, or, so just as a backup, from the course that spawned this organization, Science and Food, and our main mission is to promote knowledge of science through food and food through science. So to do that, we have three major goals in research, in undergraduate education, and in outreach. So you can read more on our blog if you could advance to the next slide, please, uh, on our website, scienceandfood.org. So before we get started, I wanted to highlight the many people who've made this event possible tonight and, um, and how all of these initiatives also rely on your support and contributions. So all of the ticket sales go to supporting um, this event and making it possible. And, um, and if you um, should feel so inclined to make a tax deductible donation, you can also do that on our website under the Support Us page. So we'll also have the very stylish science and food tote bags for sale after the event, uh, if you'd like to support us in that way as well. So if you could advance to the next slide, please, I'd like to highlight some of the, um, the people who have made today's event possible. The amazing Laura Kinsinger, who has organized all aspects of this event. Critical support from the Division of Life Sciences, Dean Victoria Sork as well as Drs. Barney Schlinger and Michelle Crosby-Watson of the Department of Integrative Biology and Physiology. In addition, Associate Vice Provost Wendy Slesser and, and Hannah Milan of the Healthy Campus Initiative, as well as the numerous volunteers who you've seen throughout um, this evening. We're also thrilled to partner with the LA Times Food Festival this year. Angus Dillon and Jonathan Gold are the masterminds behind this month-long long lineup of activities, uh, and they have the vision of including our science and food event in this um, esteemed lineup. So last but not least, Imperfect Produce has contributed pieces of Imperfect Produce. You'll find um, little mandarins uh, to take home with you tonight. So in addition, contributions from Department of Integrative Biology and Physiology, Healthy Campus Initiative, Division of Life Sciences, Whole Foods, National Science Foundation, as well as President Napolitano's Global Food Initiative that supports uh, events like this to promote food literacy. Okay, so a brief introduction about tonight's event. Um, the theme is food waste, which is a significant problem. Over 40% of food is wasted, and so if we could help to reduce the amount of food waste, this would really make a big positive impact on both the environment as well as social justice and also save you money. This is an especially timely topic given President Janet Napolitano's University of California Global Food Initiative, uh, which addresses how to sustainably and nutritiously feed a world population expected to, to reach 8 billion people by 2025. Here at UCLA, we're actively working on reducing food waste on multiple fronts. That includes reusing wasted cooking oil for biodiesel, over 400 gallons each month by UCLA Dining, so way to go, and also figuring out how to redistribute unused food to students in need of a meal. So clearly, food waste is a complex challenge, um, and we're very fortunate for the food visionaries who are transforming the way to think about this problem. So we're very excited to bring together four inspiring leaders this evening, a chef and food activist, 
a food policy and recycling expert, as well as a scientist who's quantifying the environmental impact of food waste, and a culinarian who is a food expert and, um, and master in, um, in engaging people in riveting conversations. So, Throughout the evening, you're going to hear more about methods that are being developed using science and technology to measure food waste, as well as take home messages to translate to your own home, workplace, and communities. All right, so without further ado, I'm going to now introduce the, um, all the speakers, but please hold your applause until they all walk out onto stage at the same time. So first of all, Chef Massimo Batura, who we're absolutely thrilled to have with us today. It's very exciting, yes. Massimo is the chef of Austria Franciscana, which is one of the world's most celebrated restaurants. It has been awarded three Michelin stars and has been within the top five of the world's best 50 restaurants since 2010. Massimo is a leading figure in modern gastronomy, clearly. He is equally inspiring as a food activist. In 2016, he founded the nonprofit organization Food for Soul to empower communities to fight against food waste and support food insecure people. Already, Food for Soul has served tens of thousands of meals and has harnessed the energies of dozens of chefs from around the world to join in projects to serve meals, for example, in Rio during the Olympics and in Milan during Expo 2015. Massimo is also the author of Never Trust a Skinny Italian Chef, uh, who's, and this book will be available um, also for signing after the event this evening. Next, we're delighted that Amy Hamas is with us this evening. She's a recycling specialist for the city of Burbank. She is also co-chair of the LA Food Policies Food Recovery Working Group and committee member on LA County's Roadmap to Sustainability. She's a master's in public administration and sustainability from Presidio Graduate School and a certificate in recycling and resource management from the California Resource and Recovery Association. She was previously the director of reuse for Ecoset Consulting, where she started the program donating unserved food from production sets, where she also recovered and donated hundreds of tons of material from sets for use in local communities. We're also very excited that UCLA professor Jenny Jay is here to join us. Jenny is a professor in civil and environmental engineering here at UCLA. She has degrees, bachelor's, master's, and PhD from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She's the recipient of numerous awards, uh, including the most prestigious award in the nation for young scientists, the Pre Presidential Early Career Award in Science and Engineering, as well as the Pritzker Fellowship for Environmental Sustainability. Her research addresses a wide range of topics, including antibiotic resistance, coastal water quality, and the carbon footprint associated with food choices. Jenny also teaches the popular UCLA class, Food, a Lens for Environment and Sustainability, and directs the Center for Environmental Research and Community Engagement, which addresses local environmental justice issues through research. You can also follow her blog that she recently launched on low carbon footprint recipes at www.easymealsfortheplanet.com. So to moderate this evening's discussion, we're delighted that the queen of culinary conversation, AKA Evan Kleiman, who's a food expert and UCLA alumnus, is, um, is here to join us. We're especially grateful that Evan made the journey on time on her United flight <laughs> from Chicago, where she was receiving her um, her Who's Who of Food and Beverage in America Award from the James Beard Foundation. Evan is a highly su successful chef, restaurateur, pie baker, cookbook author, and perhaps best known for her radio show and podcast, Good Food, um, which was nominated for a James Beard Foundation Award as well. On Good Food, for those of you who don't know, it's an amazing show that airs on KCRW, a NPR station in Southern California. Evan has interviewed thousands of food experts from all perspectives, um, so um, from including culture to science to food waste to policy. So she graduated with an MBA and a um, and bachelor's degree also from UCLA. Um, she's also recently returned to teach here. Her upcoming summer course, if you could switch to the next slide please, is entitled We Are Stardust, A Moral Ecology of Food. So UCLA students, you better register now. 
All right, so, um, so that's all for the, um, the introductions. Um, tonight's event is a panel discussion, so you'll hear a little six-minute uh, blurb from each of our speakers and before they launch into conversation. We have, um, are taking questions from the audience. Please write them on the cue cards that the volunteers will be circulating around. They'll then pick them up and redistribute them to Evan on stage so you can get your questions answered throughout the evening. You can also follow and, uh, and send in your questions by Twitter, uh, at Science and Food. All right, so that's all, folks, and um, enjoy the evening. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. And um, thank you to these esteemed panelists. Um, I want to give a special thank you to Massimo for coming so far and doing so much while you're here. It's really appreciated. Um, I've asked. <laughs> thank you. Um, just to set the conversation up a little bit, I've asked um, each of the panelists to prepare just a really short introduction that talks a little bit about um, who they are, what work they're involved in that pertains to our conversation. Um, so we're going to start with Jenny J. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, okay, so our um, food systems play a really major role in the environmental challenges that we're facing. Um, in fact, agriculture is a major driver in fresh water use, biodiversity loss, greenhouse gas production, um, land use, land use changes, um, antibiotic resistance, and nutrient pollution. Next slide. Uh, so different foods vary in their environmental impacts and in the greenhouse gas emissions that are embodied in their production. As you can see here, a list of foods. Oh, the formatting is, uh, has left off some of the foods. But basically, you can see um, the greenhouse gases that are involved in the production of the different foods. You can see, actually, uh, beef and lamb are at the bottom. And you might wonder, why is that? Why are they so high? Um, and the answer is that, you know, whenever we grow crops and instead of eat them directly feed to livestock, there's a kind of multiplier involved in the calculation. It takes into account the resources that go into growing that food, the transportation of that feed, and then a conversion factor for the animal um, metabolism. But what happens when you have uh, goats and pigs, I'm sorry, not pigs, cows, <laughs> sheep, and goats, um, they're ruminant animals, so you have a, an additional amount of global warming potential that comes from the methane. Um, next slide, please. OK, so how do, how do these conversion factors look when you apply them to an actual meal? Uh, we chose uh, veggie burritos as a starting point. And you can see the, in the large white numbers here, that shows the grams of CO2 equivalents uh, that would be associated with each part of the burrito. So you can see the raw veggies and the avocado are the bottom two squares. And then up top, you have beans and cooked veggies. And the total for this meal would be 88 grams of CO2 equivalent. Um, next slide. Uh, for comparison, we did a beef burrito. We kept the bottom two squares the same, um, the veggies and the avocado. But we then uh, substituted in beef and cheese, both uh, from ruminants, animal, and cow. So you get a quite a large increase. So it's about an order of magnitude we're looking at. Um, almost 900 grams of CO2 equivalents. Um, next slide. And how do these types of numbers stack up against other activities that we do? Uh, let's just take another example. This is a lentil soup. Lentils are quite low on that scale of, of the uh, very low conversion factor. Um, and so you can see this meal has around 71 grams of CO2 equivalents. If you did switch that out for a similar portion of a beef chili, you're looking at 3,000 grams of CO2. But again, what do these numbers mean? Just switching out one meal one time saves the equivalent of driving 13 miles in a car. Um, and if you did a similar shift every day for a year, that's almost 5,000 miles 
of uh, saved. Um, next slide. Oh, um, okay. And then moving into to waste, um, a huge fraction. So this is a very big number, 30 to 40% of the food in this country is wasted. Um, and that has a very large carbon footprint. Of course, just making all that food had a carbon footprint, um, which is according to the numbers that I was just showing. Um, and also disposal has an additional footprint that we'll talk about in a moment. Next slide, please. Um, so you can see here, you might wonder, where is all this waste occurring? This slide shows the different steps in production from production losses at the top through handling and down to consumer losses at the bottom. And in each set of bars, the, the different bars show different categories of food. So you can see up at the top, fruits and veggies being wasted at production scale. Maybe they don't look perfect, so they get wasted at that point. But uh, you can just see by the size of the white bars that down the, at the bottom, the consumer losses is where we're getting a lot of food waste. And this includes in-home in and out-of-home consumer losses. Uh, next slide. And what does this mean for a typical budget in a family? A uh, recent study showed $1,000 to $2,000 per year spent in a typical home in this country on wasted food. Um, and does it have to be this way? Absolutely not. Um, we waste a lot in this country at this time. So if you go a couple of decades back, we weren't wasting as much food. And if you look around the world, you see much less food waste. For example, the, the FAO recently reported that consumers in this country waste 10 times more than a typical Southeast Asian home. Um, next slide. Um, and so what's, what about this additional footprint that we mentioned before? You know, where does that food go? If it goes to a landfill, um, it will be degrading and many times producing methane. So this UK study shows a fantastic, incredible um, statistic that if you remove the food scraps from the landfill, that is the equivalent of taking a one-fifth of all of the cars in the country off the road. That's really um, an incredible statistic. Next slide. Oh boy, so a little formatting issue here, uh, but, but I can just describe it. Uh, so this, is, this chart compares different options for uh, disposing of food. And what it shows is that for different food types, the landfilling is where you get the, the biggest global warming potential. And that's because of that methane being produced um, when the process goes anaerobic in the landfill. Um, there are other processes that are also anaerobic, but where the methane is easier to capture. And it can actually be an energy source. In anaerobic digestion, for example, you can capture the methane. Um, composting is a really interesting one. So a home compost that you know, has a crank and you uh, tend to it, uh, it can be the best way to manage waste from an environmental standpoint. But if you don't take care of it, you don't crank it enough and it goes anaerobic, it actually goes from being the best way to the worst way. So that's pretty interesting. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so it's really critical we need to do many things about this problem. Luckily, there are a lot of things that we can do and that are going on at each stage. So to be brief, I'm not going to go through them. You can see them. Uh, I did want to mention one fun example that would be uh, re-engineering. So this would uh, happen when a farmer realized that he was wasting at a certain point in time 70% of the carrot crop because it wasn't straight um, and wasn't able to be sold in the traditional way as part of a little bunch of straight carrots. Uh, so he invented baby carrots by just chopping it up um, and was being able to then use all those bits and sell it at a higher rate per pound than the straight ones. So that's pretty interesting. And then just one more slide. Uh, just in summary, so uh, every time we buy food or uh, use food, eat, it's, a, it's an opportunity to express our values so you know, we can buy um, support brands, support restaurants, that whose values align with our own. Um, we can eat low carbon foods. Um, we can avoid waste and also we can learn about the issue and, and get involved. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so one of the reasons I was excited to deal with, with these three particular panelists is I feel like 
Um, they have widely divergent views and work on different parts of the food waste area. Um, Amy works on one that I think is one of the most important, um, policy. Yes. This thing on? Yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. This is an incredibly important issue, and it's one I've been working on for about 10 years. And I got to tell you, for many, many of those years, um, people kind of looked at you like, huh? Like no one really thought about it, but once you start connecting the dots to this issue, you really see how important and crucial and common this issue is. So next slide. So I work at the city of Burbank. I'm a recycling specialist, so I deal with waste all the time. And we're constantly being challenged by different kinds of state policies to be able to increase what we call our diversion rate. And diversion means diverting it away from landfill. So when you hear diversion rates that I might be talking about, that's what I'm saying. Um, but waste is a man-made invention. I mean, have you ever really thought about it from that perspective? That is something that we've created because in nature, um, one organism's discard is another organism organism's food or shelter or tool. So if we really looked at it from that perspective and we shifted it back into how nature looks at it, we might actually have some great problem, uh, great solutions here. And if you look at it also from the waste aspect, I mean, Jennifer had some amazing information regarding that, but 97% of our food waste is going into the landfill. And now we know what happens to it. It creates methane gas. Go ahead. Next slide. So. And she kind of mentioned that the 40% of all food that's grown in this country is wasted, which is really, really a unique problem to the West. You talk to anybody from another country, they're going to think that's just obscene. Um, but then you've also got 20% of all those materials of organic food waste is going into landfill. So if you think about that from a diversion standpoint, imagine if we can start to get this material out of landfill, how much more room that's going to make for our landfills as well. Because who in the audience wants to live next to a landfill? I don't see too many hands, right? So if we close one, we got to find another place for it, right? Until we do things to be able to conserve and reduce the amount that's going in. And food is a logical target. And then also, the real obscene part of this is that one in seven people in the state of California are food insecure, meaning that they struggle to put enough food on the table to feed their families. Next slide. So. Talk about policy, because that's part of what I have to do in addition to outreach and getting people like yourselves thinking about this issue. There's kind of an ends to the means here, and that is to divert this stuff away from landfill. And there's a lot of policies that have driven it. Um, the first one was in 2006. It was AB 13, 32. And AB means assembly bill to those who aren't into policy. And that is what really kind of started the ball rolling as far as diversion um, and looking at it from a greenhouse gas mitigation tool. Um, um, then I'm going to skip to the AB 1826 because that's really talking about organics. 8341 was about mandatory commercial recycling, which means that all businesses now have to have some type of recycling service through their waste hauler. AB 1826 came around, started um, last April. And what that is, is the same kind of policy, but it's for organic material. So when we say organics, we're talking about food waste, um, soiled paper products and things like that, yard waste. Um, and so that is something, folks, just so you know, the new normal is coming. Um, we're starting with commercial uh, businesses first, but it's going to be coming to you know your curbside program near you eventually. Um, and then one that's the most recent was just passed, um, signed by Governor Brown last fall, AB 1383, and that is actually also aligning with the 75%. Um, reduction in organic by 2025. But the kicker to this is, and I love this one, it's that 20% uh, reduction in disposable edible um, food, meaning that human consumption. So we're going to have to start looking at recovery as part of our diversion tool in the toolbox. Go ahead. Next slide. And things are shifting. Not only do we have statewide policies, we've got cities that are getting on the board, for, especially for zero waste. Los Angeles has adopted a zero waste policy. So again, zero waste is another way that cities are focusing on how do we get this stuff out of landfill. This stuff is, you know, a lot of our resources that are going, you know, into the disposal system are actually resources and not waste. But there's no other way to deal with them right now, so they are. So that's why the cities are starting to look at their zero waste. And what zero waste means, it, you know, we know that you're never we're not going to have waste, but it means 90% diversion from landfill or greater. So that means what, what we're really trying to get at is that the bar is always going to be raised. 
If you hit 90%, well, what else can you do? We're always looking for ways to be able to get the stuff out of a landfill. And so um, what also makes LA unique, they went to a uh, what we call an exclusive franchise system. Um, so all their haulers, they went from 100 haulers, they're going to seven. They're going to service the entire uh, region of Los Angeles. And in order for those haulers to get the business, they had to upgrade their fleet um, and make sure that their, their uh, vehicles were uh, going to be, had you know, low emissions. They had to pay a living wage because the waste industry is kind of notorious for, for paying very poorly. Um, and then also, they had to, and this is the unique thing for LA and the first city in the country, they are actually mandating their waste haulers that get these contracts that they have to provide a food donation program for their clients. That's huge. It's a big deal. Because think about this. The waste industry, they built their whole business model on hauling your stuff away and putting it in a hole in the ground. And now they actually have to conserve. It's, uh, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's very exciting, though. Next slide. And this is some of the things that we can do to help infrastructure because Los Angeles um, County is very devoid of dealing with this material. Northern California has a lot more outlets and resources and infrastructure for dealing with organic waste. Los Angeles is way behind. So in a way, these policies and these state mandates have actually kick, ha, kicked our butts in gear to start getting prepared for the, the, you know, the goals of the future. And so in order to do that, the state is recognizing that you know, there's going to need, need some boost. And so they provided two grants. One them just expired or just uh, closed in March, but that's for infrastructure. But the one I'm most excited about, and this is a brand new one, um, it's for uh, food prevention and recovery. So they're actually offering $5 million in different increments of like $25,000 up to $100,000 um, for nonprofits and businesses to get creative on ways that they can reduce and recover food. So it's really exciting. Go ahead. And um, in my bio, they mentioned that my previous life before I got into government, um, I worked for a production company. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the filming industry, but it's a very, very wasteful industry if you've ever been behind the scenes. And so what this company, Ecoset, did is we worked with commercial productions to zero waste the set. So we worked with the production before, during the shoot, and then after. And my role in donations was to recover all of the useful stuff that they throw away. And it becomes like a tornado. I mean, they just want to get out of that rented location after you know, shooting for a couple days, they're tired, they, they have the get me out of here syndrome, and they just want to throw everything away. And what I was, I was dumpster prevention. As you can see, I had no problem jumping in dumpsters as well. And nothing made me happier to fish something out of a dumpster and then take it to our reuse center where we gave everything free away. So if anybody needs free resources and art materials, see me after this, we can talk about that. You know, we give everything away free, and so nothing made me happier was I fished something out of that dumpster and then someone walked away with it a couple days later. Next slide. So part of my work at um, Ecoset is we're reducing, you know, we were recovering all this material, but then at lunch, um, you know, the, the f uh, sets are feeding people all the time and they cater the food too. So you might have 80 crew members that are getting catered food and then they're throwing so much of it away because you can't run out of food. That's like, you know, the worst sin in the world. So there was all kinds of food that was being discarded and we would compost that, but I thought we could do better. And so I started a food recovery and donation program where I actually worked um, with a lot of different nonprofits and made kind of a map so we could figure out where we were going to shoot. So if we were in Malibu or Long Beach, we had a partner that would come and pick up. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Next slide. And food donation, guys, it is possible. You hear all the time, oh, we're going to get sued, or, you know, or I can't do this. The public health department's going to shut me down. There are a lot of resources out there, and there are a lot of groups that are working on this issue. And so make sure we kind of get that mindset out of our heads, because it is definitely possible. It's encouraged, and we can do this with some great planning. Go ahead. And then finally, since this is a science and technology, I'm not the most uh, keen on that particular subject personally, so we have our true wonk here, um, but I actually have worked with um, some software technology for tracking. Um, and so it helps a lot of our food service providers to be able to measure this this um, food waste footprint that they have. Because you know what? Once you start to look at things and you audit and you, you identify problems in your system, it becomes a teachable moment for your staff. It also becomes a, a, a reducer in food waste, of course, but also saves you money, too, because there might be, um, you know, some of your workers you know, in the restaurant don't know how to properly wrap something to put it in the, into the food, uh, into the refrigerator, and then you have food waste from that. So um, these different types of technologies can really help businesses monitor that. And I think that's it.
Thank you so much. Massimo, please. Hello. <clears throat> I'm going to be very quick. So, I'm a chef. Um, 32 years ago, I decided to give up uh, my study on uh, to become a lawyer, and uh, I decided to follow my passion. Um, and uh, I opened a small restaurant in a, in a country. 22 years ago, um, I opened Osteria Francescana. It's a small little restaurant with big dreams. And, uh, you know, we still now, after 22 years, having these uh, amazing dreams. And, uh, and bigger and bigger. But never, ever, I would think about making something or became uh, a food activist in this uh, kind of, uh, with this kind of big ideas and uh, create a foundation Food for Soul with my, with my wife, just to raise money using my image to open, uh, um, uh, to help to open and fight, uh, fight the food waste. Three years ago, four years ago, we, I saw uh, some, uh, some numbers, uh, which like 860 million people they, they don't have anything to eat, and uh, 1.4, uh, that now is uh, 1.9 billion are overweight. And 1.3 billion tons of food is wasted every year. The medium is like 33% uh, of the food uh, that we produce is waste. So uh, what I, when I had to confront uh, the universal exposition that was in Milan um, in, uh, two years ago, uh, all the different nations, they start asking me as a, a referent or in Italy as a chef uh, to be involved in many different uh, situations. But they never, never, and no one ask us what we were thinking, really, what the meaning of feed the planet. And, um, and so I decided to create my own pavilion. And uh, so this is one of the biggest dreams of my life. And, uh, but I didn't have the money to do it. So I knocked at the door of the church because uh, I was uh, thinking that uh, with the new pope, Pope Francis, uh, it could be very open to an idea like this. They, they open, they, they listen to what I had to say, and they said, thank you. It's a great idea. Thanks for your passion and your energy. Come back in one week and we'll let you know. And one week later, they said, we found uh, the perfect space. It's a old theater. Instead of being in the center of Milan, that is like the center of the city, uh, from, we would love to give some, uh, some light, bring some light to the periphery of Milan in a neighborhood, in the poorest neighborhood where there's the home of the refugees, uh, the, you know, it's the poorest place in, uh, in Milan, Quartiere Greco. And there is a very nice priest that is going to help you. So we went there to find out what we, it could be, you know. And uh, this guy, Don Giuliano, was looking at me. And instead of talking about the place or talking about what, what you want to do here, why are you here, he said, look at the train. The train is beautiful. Look, you see, the train is moving, moving, moving. That's the future. And if, you, if we can understand this kind of mentality, you know, we can make it. I look at him and I said, this is the good, the right person. This is really a guy who really can, can make the difference. And uh, 
you know, one year later, we open uh, this place. Uh, um, is a uh, uh, we we, build, we 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 in, together with architects uh, involving artists involving designer. We create an amazing place full of beauty. And uh, because I in my idea was uh, I want to rebuild something as Leonardo da Vinci did 500 years ago. But I want to do it better and more beautiful, very contemporary. And uh, so uh, the, all, all the architects uh, from uh, the Polytechnic of Milan uh, with Renzo Piano, they came, they look at the space, they rebuilt a beautiful space uh, uh, being with a lot of respect for the architecture of the 30s. The artists like Kuki, like uh, Paladino, like Carlo Benvenuto, they, may, they create um, pieces just for this reason. And uh, Manucci, no more excuses, a 22 meters neon outside that was saying, no more excuses. Let's stop talking. Let's start acting. And, uh, you know, the designer, they create amazing tables as the communal tables of the of the monk they use the Franciscan monks, uh, in which uh, you can confront the other, in which uh, you can create a family. So the meaning of this was not just to to create another soup kitchen. I think we don't we didn't need another soup kitchen. We need a space that united people. We need a space that we rebuild the dignity of the people. We need the, the chef, their time, their knowledge, their creativity to create something and to fight against waste. The, for one night, dedicate one night, one day of their, of their time to come down in Milan, unload the track, and for one day, put in, in the mind of my grandmother. Because uh, when I grew up under the table of the kitchen, in the meantime that my grandmother was rolling pasta, I was still in tortellini, but also I was going to bed asking for a warm cup of milk full of breadcrumbs, a little bit of sugar, and was my favorite meal. And look where I am. So I think uh, after this, one day, we were in bed, it's six uh, in the morning, I received a message, Cristina Suendar, uh, from uh, the mayor of Rio de Janeiro. The refectory in Milan became uh, the major uh, you know, idea of the Universal Exposition. And uh, so the mayor of Rio said, during the Olympics, we really need a project like yours, and we're going to give you the space to, to build something like that. And uh, so I, we, I put together um, um, a group of uh, a team with Christina, so, you know, uh, and, and we, we built uh, a, a space. Actually, in Milan, we rebuilt it. Uh, my ear, we had to build brand new because it was uh, just a long aisle, like 48 meters long by six wide with nothing, just darkness. Darkness in which, uh, you know, there was a uh, drug, uh, people sleeping on the street. Uh, and, uh, and so we said, why not? Why not? So we start with for soul and we, in a, uh, you know, six months, we did this, and uh, we created an amazing place that now uh, the gastromotiva, refettorio gastromotiva, the volunteers, they, they, they are running and they are like serving every night, uh, you know, 100 people, and most of that, uh, a truck every day full, we save every day one truck full of vegetables and, uh, and food. In the same way, here the chefs are coming from all over 
South America and all over the world. Because after the first uh, approach we had in Milan, everyone wants to come back and dedicate their time to, to this kind of project. Because, uh, you know, we really need uh, their complicity and their spotlight to, to show to the young gen generation and give the example to the young generation what is a, a real a chef in 2017. That is, m I think, is much more than the sum of their recipe. After Rio de Janeiro, we had the example of Modena, Polonia, and the next one is going to be London. The 5th of June, we're going to open London. Uh, in these uh, two years, Food for Soul became uh, a referment of uh, this kind of activism. But most of everything is like it becomes uh, a center for in which uh, everyone of the, the chef community wants to be part of and wants to, to come and give the example and wants to share with the others. So this is what makes the difference, sharing ideas in, uh, with all the others. So next one is going to be London. And uh, just two weeks ago, we received uh, a very important uh, news from the Rockefeller Foundation, who gave us a big grant to organize and see the opportunity to open uh, many soup kitchens in the United States. My idea. <clears throat> is for the Rockefeller Foundation. My idea is like, the first thing is like, my passion are music, art, uh, and food. So first one could be New Orleans, you know, for what, what happened in, in the city, for the jazz and the community. Could be Detroit, you know, after everything and, uh, you know, that happened. And the Bronx, the smallest, co the, the, the poorest community in the United States. So I think uh, it's, uh, it's very important to talk and to make, uh, you know, to the more culture and the more information we bring and we share is extremely important. But it's also time to act. Thank you. So after hearing these three points of view, science, policy, and the heart, basically. For me, what, what I think all the time about this is culture. And I think about what we have to do to affect a kind of cultural change that causes people to want to engage where they are, not in some idealistic place, but in a place where they can where we can each take our own individual actions, whatever that might mean. I think the United States, we have some really interesting, unique challenges. I, I want to ask Massimo a couple things. Um, when I think about Italian culture, I think about a culture of frugality. People are used to shopping frequently, buying small amounts. Um, making great use of everything. Um, it's a culture where you could write a cookbook about how to use stale breadcrumbs. Um, it's going to be out next uh, <laughs> <laughs> next October. Next October, it's going to be called Bread is Gold: A yeah. Food Revolution. See, yeah, I, I, it's absolutely um, a, a genius culture for that. And then you look at our culture, a culture of such, we're driven by the need to feel that there is abundance, not just of objects or food, but choices. Um, we're not good at, at focusing in and making the smart choice. We want to make every choice. Um, how important do you think it's going to be to 
or rather, let me let me go back. You had so much support from the church. Okay, you had so much support from the church. Oh my God! Right? You got, no, the, yeah, the church. Uh, I think. Uh, I so think we, uh, all things start with uh, the new pope. Okay, uh, you know, it, it's true. It's true. It's true because uh, because uh, since you know you had the German pope that look at you like that and he's like, you have to do this, you have to do that. You you don't listen. You don't listen. You you just do whatever you want. But if you have uh, Papa Francesco that he comes to you and he said, Buon appetito a tutti. It's like buon appetito a tutti. The people say buon appetito a tutti. Wow, that's that's very interesting. Two words that with uh, an humbleness, total humbleness, breaking protocols. You know, my life is not important. I'm here for you. You know, we don't okay. have that person. This is. This is <laughs> We uh, don't you know, no, have that person. Like this, it's like in the moment in which everyone is building walls everywhere, uh, Brexit here, there, Mexico, everywhere, walls. We are breaking walls. In the meantime, in the in the same time, uh, you know, in Rio de Janeiro, when we arrived, they were closing soup kitchen because they didn't. They want to hide the like the poverty from all the tourists that were coming for the Olympics. So what we do? We open soup kitchen. So yeah, we have to do that. You know, we have to be, we have to break. They, we all swimming up the Po River. You know, it's not, I'm not following. I'm, I'm going against if something is wrong. Culture, knowledge, consciousness, sense of responsibility. Amy, you're jumping at the bed. You want to jump in here? Um. About the Pope? <laughs> <laughs> no, about so much about you, Catholic. So much about what you do is um, is education mm -hmm. and um, inspiration. Try. And so, what what cultural barriers or cultural goodnesses are there to embrace the message? What have you found that can really work to open people up? to accept the message. It's, it's interesting because um, in the city of Burbank, we have a very high Armenian population, as well as a lot of the, the food service workers are of uh, you know Latino um, heritage. And so, yeah, your outreach materials, of course, have to speak to that. But um, you know, as far as that goes, as far as the cultural part of it, I think it's actually an inherently American thing, like you were saying. It's we, we need abundance, and we don't think about these things. You know, um, when I said before that waste is a man-made invention, it's actually the other thing that I say a lot is um, there is no such thing as a way. Oh. So when you throw something away. <laughs> Where is a way, right? It's just away from us, right? It becomes somebody else's problem. So we have to kind of think about that. So I think, you know, inherently, no matter what the culture is, um, we're not really cognizant of that because we have all these ser city services that take this stuff away from us. And so, like you were saying about the poverty, you know, hiding that, we hide our waste as well. So I think from a cultural standpoint, we have to really get into just the American psyche, not just, you know, that of, of different heritages. I think uh, the, uh, we also have to look at waste in a different way, because uh, why waste? It's not a waste. It wasn't waste. Yesterday I was at the Los Angeles Times. They they prepare a table for me to, with uh, a lot of ingredients that was waste, and I said this is not waste. This banana is much better than the one you buy on the shelf yeah. because this is this is amazing. Mm -hmm. It's very tasty and concentrated. But uh, if you think about the culture of Mexican and Brazilian uh, and Brazil, they wait till the banana they become a little bit brown to get the flavor and concentrate the flavor. So why waste? Because it's our culture. Yeah. But what is the right one? I we just have to throw away, cancel from the vocabulary the way, waste, yeah. the word waste, and think about a little bit ugly, a little bit chat, uh, overripe. It's yeah, really, you know, it's really talk with a different vocabulary and, you know, so the people, they can have a different approach to that food. At that point, you know, you look at breadcrumbs and you look at bread in a different way and you analyze the whole life of bread. You have a, you have a piece of bread just baked, and it's right to be served at the table, you know, in a, and fragrant and beautiful. 
Then one day hold. What do you do? Oh, I love that bread. But that's that's the point. <laughs> one day hold. You slice it. You make bruschetta, and uh, you make a al pomodoro. You can do whatever you want. Soup with bread. And uh, and when is uh, when is four days old, you braid it, and you have bread crumbs, and you can do one thousand, one hundred thousand things with that. And with the book, we're going to show what you can do. With it. <laughs> and it's kind of promoting the book. Eh? I'm, I'm the worst of that. But, you know, it was, it, with breadcrumbs, I, I, it was like the best and most emotional. Uh, I understand know. completely. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, That's very good. Thinking, thinking about what you said about changing one's perspective on waste, I, I think of the human waste involved in all of this, in the cycle, from growing to, um, to the slime we throw away um, from our produce um, bins, and um, just the amount of water and human, and to me more than anything, the human energy that, that goes into that which gets thrown away. Um, Jenny, I want to ask you um, more about composting. Because so many of us at home, and, and maybe Amy too, you can both get into this. I feel like I'm getting a lot of mixed messages about what I'm allowed to put into the green bin. I um, used to compost myself, but I did what Jenny said, not do it well. And I was um, very aware that I was creating a bigger problem. So I started using the green bin. And then I was told recently, no, you can't put coffee grounds in the green bin. You can't put this in the green bin or that in the green bin. And I'm thinking to myself, but, but it's all compostable. So why can't we? Do you want me to take that one first? Yes. I know that was for you, but OK. Well, I just, I'll be real quick. I just, um, just so you guys know, remember I mentioned before that you know we're eventually going to have to be doing this, even from the residential side, but we start with commercial first. The reason why you can, the, there's the riddle of the Sphinx. The reason why you can't put your food waste currently into your green bin is because there is not, there are many composting facilities in Los Angeles County, but not one of them is permitted to take food waste. So when food starts to break down, you know how it smells in your garbage. Once this highly putrescible material gets into a normal composting um, facility, it's actually going to affect the methane gas emissions. So these facilities have to be permitted. And once you start getting into that kind of material, the regulations get a lot more complex. OK, so this makes me really crazy, because I just I think, issue everybody weekly bags of sawdust <laughs> or some other carbonaceous material that we can layer into our green bins. Yes so that the composting process starts already yeah. in the green bin. It's well, and so the whole thing is it's coming. As soon as we can get our permitting in Los Angeles County and we have more ways to deal with this material, again, outside of landfill, then it's going to be in our green bins as well, which would be a really cool thing. Or you can buy backyard compost. But for now, you're not supposed to be putting it in there. Although we're not going to go through your bin either. <laughs> OK, and Jenny, now I'm going to ask you about energy. Um, waste to energy. Are you aware of any projects that are models right now of um, either anaerobic digesters or any kind of innovative solutions that are scalable or already at scale? Sure. I mean, a lot of wastewater treatment plants run anaerobic digesters and use that energy to power the plant. So it's definitely something that um, can work well in that um, arena. And there's another facility that just opened in Paris, not Paris, uh, Europe, but uh, Paris, California. So it's, it's an anaerobic digestion facility. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so that just opened recently. And there's so. Naples in Florida, yeah. Paris, California. Yeah. There's a Paris, Texas, too. But yes, Paris, so California. Yeah. And I think it's P-E-R-I-S. I haven't been out there. But uh, anyway, and, and you were saying with our wastewater treatment facilities, there's that. And there's also going to be a pilot in Playa del Rey um, where they're actually going to use with their incinerator because um, they have all that new development. So they're going to be doing a food waste pilot in Playa del Rey with your... Uh, Garbage disposal. By the way, sorry, um, garbage disposal was uh, invented by a relative of mine, which is kind of an ironic thing. <laughs> I get none of the royalties, though, but anyway. Um, Massimo, the kind of food that you make at, at Osteria Francescana is very considered. The portions aren't huge. It's not 
this kind of abundance uh, that one thinks of one thinks of home cooking or you know the Olive Garden. <laughs> um, it's work there. Do you do you? I don't. I don't, know. I, I, don't <laughs> I don't smile. I, I just want to listen. Listen to the question. That I want to see where so, she's going. I, I really feel. I really feel like chefs have such a power right now. Do you think that the conversation of the just the the unwise sort of abundance um, can be addressed because so much of what's wasted is driven by restaurateurs and chefs who want the illusion of abundance knowing that at the end of the day there'll be a certain amount thrown away. I don't think, uh, yeah, I think uh, restaurants right now in 2017 uh, is uh, are, are different than 20 years ago. But you can see, you can read the, 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 the moment, you know. Uh, chefs right now are working to put attic close to the aesthetic of their food. Using the attic, the aesthetic without the attic part is not beauty at all. The attic part is like is extremely important part of what we do every day. Think about Osiri Francescana. Osiri Francescana is a laboratory of ideas. We produce culture. In which uh, without Osiria, we couldn't do and we couldn't have the right attitude to do this kind of stuff. I can't dream without that. In Osiria, we produce culture. Think about the the, the word everything, ragu of everything, broth of everything, vegetable bo uh, soup of everything. You know, everything is an enormous, amazing, powerful word in the right hands. If you have the knowledge to manage the word everything, otherwise it's a big mess. You understand? It's like, so we, we create this the plates that are everything, and we replicate these kind of words in the soup kitchen. I remember Ferran Adria coming inside Milan and uh, checking out everything, you know, and he tastes uh, this uh, um, Bolognese sauce that I did the day before with, with every, everything I had. So I was opening almost expired pancetta plastic bag with mixing with, uh, you know, the vegetable I had. A lot of, uh, I use a lot of uh, celery because there was not enough carrots and uh, just few onions. Uh, then uh, I correct that with some uh, of uh, uh, intense meat because I had sweetness but not uh, sapidity. Then I, I had uh, a lot of uh, turkey breast and uh, a lot of bone marrow. So I did a ragu of everything, a bolognese sauce of everything. Ferran tasted and said, oh, this is fantastic. What is that? I said, it's the ragu made with what I had yesterday. <laughs> so, and he used it for his plate because it was like, it's a, pa a passage. We were passing from one to another, all these kind of things. In Brazil, we ha I had to clean the refrigerator. I opened it. And there was a, the old refrigerator full of, uh, you know, leftover from the other chefs. You know, I, I pass my knowledge to the volunteers that are part of this project, and I teach them how to use those. So if you have a green, you know, vegetables, you can't put it and boil that. You have to soak it, extract the flavor, let the water evaporate and use and mix it with a potato that has been boiled. More, you know, you have uh, like uh, some uh, beans uh, in a vacuum packed uh, from Alex Atala or like uh, 
some something from a Brazilian uh, uh, chef and 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 I mean, sorry, a Mexican chef. So I put together everything, all the culture, all the different culture, driven by my mental power, and uh, that's why we, you need the chef. Okay. Because is the chef, they are making visible the invisible for everyone. So the people who are the customers who are eating this food, give us just a sense of that experience. The customer who are eating? The people who are that the, you're eating. Yes, your guests. Yeah. Your guests. Yeah. Your guests yeah. who are eating this food. Because to me, the, the sort of extraordinary thing about your project is the soul, the soul that's in it, what it uh, does uh, to the people. It's because all about so, this. Because it's, these are people... If you don't have, uh, you don't have uh, this, uh, you just go in your restaurant and think about how to make money. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you have a dream, uh, you know, uh, you, don't, you, you, you don't have the, uh, that as priority. You, you have to survive. You have to make money to pay the bill at the end of the month. But it's not my culture. Uh, I come from a different culture. And, uh, you know, uh, I, to me, in my future, there's always going to be future. I'm in university. I believe in culture. I said yes because uh, this is the place for culture. And in my dream is to build a university in Modena. And uh, build a university in which uh, the chefs they will know more about soil and the future of the farmers. They will know more about taste. So if they grow together, they're going to respect much more each other. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this was like five years ago a dream. Now uh, it's already been financed by the European community. It's going to be in the next uh, five years. It's going to be a reality. So it's about this life. It's about having heart. So, so, so passion. Cal exit. Um, I know that there's going to be quest, there are questions that we have on cards. Are they coming? I don't think I can get up and take them from everyone. Is there someone? I'm, I'm here, yeah, we, you know, oh, here we have. Thank you, Massimo. Okay. Here's. <laughs> I'm checking the, 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 the question. If I don't like them, <laughs> check control. Trump style. <laughs> well, let's not go there. <laughs> oh, there are more. Yeah. I don't think I understand no, this question. No, no, no. Do you use a bimbi? What's a bimbi? I use a bimbi. Yes, I do it. <laughs> it's a thermal mixer. Oh. Actually, is it was one of the uh, uh, when I create this sauce that is a. Uh, is a Parmigiano Reggiano sauce, is the historic compromise in Modena between uh, the tortellini alla panna and tortellini in broth. You know, tortellini in broth is like the real, you know, integralist uh, of the pasta with broth uh, to taste the real feeling of the tortellini and uh, the tortellini alla panna that the cheese makers they were making, like, and every single kid loves. I create this sauce with uh, Parmigiano Reggiano that is like three years old, that is extremely, uh, is already transformed the lactose in protein. And so it's, a, it's the perfect cheese also for kids. And using bimbi, I could make a sauce with water. Water and parmigiano, because for me, water is um, um, truth. When you taste the sauce with water, it's truth. I, I hate cream, butter, stuff like that, no? So I, I, I'm Italian. I'm not French. <laughs> yeah. So I, I hate this guy. I, I love this kind of lightness. And uh, you know, I made this sauce using the bimbi, starting at 55 with water 55, arriving at 85, turbo with uh, grated Parmigiano Reggiano, and the sauce came out velvet. That's water and cheese? Yeah, and, uh, and 30 years of experience. <laughs> One of my students from last 
How can we sure. bring food for soul to UCLA? Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> hey, this is for... Okay. Now Invite me and I'm coming. <laughs> I like it. In the middle of the... This is a good idea. In Los Angeles, doing food for soul in the middle of the campus would be amazing. 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 And Let's do it. And Let's you do know, it. And you Let's know. do it. Give me a space. The students are going to be the, the volunteers. No, they're going to divide one day. And they will also be the people who need to eat because yeah. hunger And they're going to be also the, 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 the people that are going to they're gonna be the new, you know, they're going to receive all the knowledge from the chef. So it's going to be the new. I'm there. Oh, that's good. Know. That's about I'm idea. there. Good. You convinced me. Okay. okay. Amy, are you familiar with the Taiwanese um, model of, of recycling? Taiwanese? Yeah, um, in I'm Taiwan. familiar with ja ja Jap Japan. Um, okay, with so the fact that Taiwanese they are very good. That model is very good. Okay. So, um, the recycling, I talk about with like the several. Um, I know it. I know it. <laughs> Do you want to know what it is? Um, Okay. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, I'm not, but if it's anything to do with uh, source separating, um, they have like, in Japan, they have like 13 different bins. They actually recycle things by different material types. So I don't know if that's what they're talking about. In Taiwan, it happens on a block by block, street yeah. by street level, and it becomes a community sort of moment where people have to physically come out and meet the truck. I love it. And yeah. Woohoo! Exactly. Yeah. All right. The music plays, I everybody comes, and. Um, so it's an event. It's an event, and if oh you don't God. come, it's a shame, I would about imagine. That. Oh. But. Yeah. Yes. So, so. <laughs> Should I explain it again? Yeah, sure. So, <laughs> so trash okay. in Taiwan is separated into a lot of different bags, um, and you have to purchase these trash bags from the federal government. Um, and ones that have like non-compostable, not non-recyclable waste is more expensive than ones where you can put recycling in and things like that. It. And it's also like you have to buy it per bag, and you nice. separate them into a bunch of different bags, and then they throw it in the truck that plays the song, the ice cream truck song. Okay, I love it, but could that happen here? Could I get anybody to do more than one blue band? Let me tell you, it's a struggle. We're, we're, I mean, we still have um, people in the city of Burbank that think plastic bag is their birthright, so, um, but I, but you know what? That didn't happen overnight, what they did in Taiwan. That happened over what time, and that's a cultural thing, and it's a government, um, you know, again, initiative where people in government had to make that policy and be brave about it, facing the wrath, so I'm sure at first as it was adopted, it was probably wobbly, maybe not as embraced, but now here it's this wonderful cultural thing that people get excited, and I love it. I'm all about that stuff. Personally, yeah, I just and, uh, think we should change the tax system and, and, yep. and people who manufacture or sell and have less impact on the planet should pay less taxes, yep. and people who make more of a mess that model, more. that model is, um, you know, it's it struggles in this country because weight, everything has been built around cheap disposal, and so to do the right thing, that's why so many new technologies and green um, uh, methods are always the more expensive option. Um, not always, but it's it's been that way traditionally because. Disposal has been so cheap. So if we start changing the model and how we fund um, these programs, that would actually be a huge step in doing the right thing. And Alameda County, if anybody's familiar with up north, um, they actually, woo -woo, shout out, um, they actually um, tax, heavily tax their landfill. So that actually funds programs to support, um, you know, green and, and, and zero waste initiatives. So it's pretty cool. So my I senior, suggest uh, to, if you have a chance to watch the movie Wasted, Produced by Anthony Bourdain, uh, it's been um, uh, show at the Tribeca Film Festival, and it's, it's going to be, be very, at the very AC. interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And from the first of uh, of um, June, 
uh, Netflix bought uh, Theaters of Life, the, all the, the story of the seven months uh, at the refectory in Milan, and the life of the people, they, were, they, are li they live uh, this kind of experience. Okay. So it's very good. So Massimo, this is a total, this is a, a total fan-based, non-food waste question. My favorite ingredient. What is your, no, not your favorite ingredient. Do, do, you, do you have a guilty pleasure when it comes to food? Do you know what this idea is, a guilty pleasure? Qualcosa che non deve mangiare perché sai che non è buona però Guilty pleasure. No, if, no. I eat, I try to eat very well, so. Uh, no Doritos, no flaming Cheetos. No, if you, but you know, the point is, eat the right quantity, you know, and have a, a good style of life. So if you, if you, if you talk with a kid and you say, don't eat Nutella, he's gonna eat Nutella all the time. This is like chocolate, uh, no, not chocolate, because there's everything except for chocolate. It is on that. Uh, uh, you know, fake, isn't it? And, and, uh, and the saturated fat. So it's like, but if you say don't eat it, he's going to eat it. So the point is, you can have a, a spoon of Nutella, but also a pear, a piece of Parmigiano, and uh, don't spend the whole afternoon in, uh, in front of the computer. Yeah. But just go and, and, and run and, uh, you know, it's... Cook. And cook. <laughs> the style, the right style of life. Okay, I'm juggling a lot here. Um, well, this is a good one. So, if we've gotten to the point where the food is no longer good, it's actually expired, not just expired because of stupid date. What can be done with it? Can it be transformed? Do you want to take that one or no? Um, well, okay, you mean it's actually got like, you know, fungus on it and things like that, like it's true. It's rotten. Because, you know, just on a side note on the date labeling, that there's actually legislation being worked on right now in the state of California to organize that because, I don't know if you guys know, but there's really no rhyme or reason to date labels, the best used, sell by, all those things. There's nothing le um, regulating that. It's more of what the manufacturers or the grocers are recommending as far as the guaranteed freshness of the product. So if you see an expired date, check the food. Don't just look at the experience. Your nose is there for a reason. Right. And your eyes as well. But to answer your question as far as what you can do with it, I mean, obviously, um, you know, we're, we're working on the infrastructure issues I mentioned earlier. But you can do a backyard compost if you've got that ability. It's the city of Burbank and Los Angeles, they actually um, give classes and um, also give discount, or in the case of Burbank, because we're awesome, we give free composters away. Um, so you can take those skills and you can make your own organic soil amendment um, in your own backyard. Um, but, but there's also other things. You know, what, you know how bad is it? Is the, is the banana brown? Did, you know, are you going to make yeah, something? Bananas, right? Okay. We know that's the high sugar contact. Um, I'll tell you, when you have blemishes, on your food, um, you know, cut around it or put it in a blender and make a smoothie. It's an amazing thing how you transform your food. If it may not look as appealing, but in a smoothie, you wouldn't know it anyway, right? So there's a lot of uh, great um, tips on things like that at savethefood.com. I don't know if you've ever heard of that great website. But they give a lot of tips on how to store food and also what types of things to do with it before and after it goes bad. Also, you know, try not to shop when you're hungry. Or sh and, to, shop more often and, to, and, shop, and to shop more often. But recently... Yeah, that's uh, the most important thing. It is. I think. It's the best recipe you can give to everyone. It's like, just uh, dedicate more time to shop to yourself. To shop. To shop and buy seasonal ingredients. You save the money. And uh, you buy the right amount for a couple of days. You keep in a refrigerator. So it's also... A stimulation process for creativity. I have this, I have to cook something called this, I have to create something with this. Till you're done. At that point, you shop again. But it's like half an hour, not more. Maybe in Los Angeles, a little bit more. 
driving. Yeah. You, know. you can always listen to a good podcast. Good podcast on your way shopping. While you're going from place to place. In, in preparation for this, I, I actually came upon two articles. Um, one was, and these are um, using food for textiles. So one is a project in which kombucha scobies, you know, the weird little floaty thing that um, creates kombucha, is being used to make textiles. And more interestingly, in Sicily, there are a couple young women who created a project to deal with citrus waste because it's such a huge problem in Sicily after they process juice. Do you know why, no? Yeah. Because uh, they bought the, the Italian government made uh, and the European community, they made a deal with Libya to help the economy of Libya. Uh, and they buy and they import uh, oranges from Libya. So there's not enough uh, requests uh, for the oranges from Sicily. Think about it. Like crazy. It's crazy, yeah. And uh, they don't have uh, the money to, to pay people to harvest the, 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 the fruit, the, the, the trees from, uh, from the oranges, and they leave the oranges like that. And the so oranges for, from Etna, the, the most amazing most, volcanic soil, oh the blood and amazing. And these oranges have a huge amount of essential oil, which is what gives them yes. the yes. aroma. So okay. what these young women have been doing is working with chemists to take these excess citrus and turn it into a textile that is self-moisturizing. So you would wear a yeah. fabric that is imbued with oil from the citrus. Yeah. And you would be bathed in deliciousness. Yeah, but uh, the, 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 the plate, uh, the recipe, oops, I dropped the lemon tart, uh, it's about that. It's about the, the broken south of Italy. Yeah. It's the most broken place in the world, you know? It's like, you, 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 you but when you walk on the Temple Valley or you swim in Capri or you taste an orange or a lemon or a caper from Pantelleria, you, you know, it's, it's a dream. And it's, it's about that. It's about uh, the soil, the farm, uh, the, the, the beauty of that. And it's like a contradiction of south of Italy. You know what I would love, because um, I know that we're going to have to wrap up soon and you're going to go sign books. Um, Me? Yes, you, I think. I have to go to eat. Yeah. Mm. Okay, maybe they'll bring you something while you're signing books. Right. <laughs> but I would love it if you could just paint us a picture, tell a story, of when the refectorio first opened and you started to serve people. And that moment of transformation in the person, which I think is another yeah. way of combating waste, right? Yeah. Uh, each each refectorio has a, had a totally different approach. One uh, in Milan, we didn't know what to expect. So we were very, you know, a little bit nervous, scared, almost scared from, uh, with the people. There were a lot of migrants at that time, you know, the problem of migrants that they passed through Milan, and, uh, but also homeless, but also normal people that, uh, you know, they, they, they divorced from, uh, from uh, family, they, they lost the job, uh, you know, they didn't have enough money to pay for, for a meal, so they were coming, you know. And uh, the first uh, 20 days, the three weeks, you know, we had a very, an approach also them, you know, they had an approach with us, like really humble, uh, intimidate, they were walking in, eat in a half an hour, three courses, being served, and uh, they left. After like three weeks, you know, step by step, you know, it, there was like a celebration every day with chefs, uh, people they were coming. Senegalese uh, were, was a um, guitar player, was uh, singing uh, country and, uh, you know, traditional uh, African music uh, for everybody. You know, it's, it was amazing. In Rio de Janeiro, it was totally different. Um, because uh, it was, we were serving the people of the neighbor, you know, 
the people they were selling themselves their body one hour later or like the kids they were running on the street or like people they were sleeping in front of the and the of the of the uh, of the refectory so it was like the neighbor that but they were you know the article what really changed everything was uh, Andrew Jacobs from the New York Times when uh, he volunteer signed to be a volunteer he came and uh, he didn't introduce himself and uh, he spent a couple of days and uh, after that he said I am Andrew Jacobs from New York Times I'm I'm gonna write about you and he he wrote the real story of Rio de Janeiro of the refectorio and he said. Uh, interview one of the couple of the, of the of the guests they said you know this is uh, the first time in our life that we've been we, we have been treated as human being uh, you know i was pinching my wife say hey, come on but is it true are they really serving you like as a, you know we feel like prince and princess you know this is uh, something that you know is going to stay with you forever and change the whole perspective all the press of the world was in line to come and check and and volunteer and understand the, what's the, what's what was the situation i want to thank everyone for coming and um, starting this conversation i feel like this is a conversation we need to have over and over Thank you so much. So Massimo will be out there. I just want to give a little shout out for UCLA students. I'm going to be teaching a class, Summer Session A. It's called We Are Stardust, A Moral Ecology of Food. And it's sort of a big picture planet ecology of your plate and allows you to take a walk through your own feelings about what you're eating. Um, have a great time. Thank you.